Jigwich and welcome back to the study of the Gospel according to St. Luke. This is the 10th part of the series so far and we are still in chapter 1, but look, that's alright, we're not in any rush. Um, I was a bit curious, so I did some calculations and found that so far we have spent roughly 3 hours, 44 minutes and 47 seconds in this chapter of this Gospel. By the end of this video, it will likely be just over four hours, and that's four hours of preaching, and we still haven't met Jesus yet. Now, we've been told about him, he's been mentioned, but we haven't met him yet. Why do I bring this up? Well, because I think it shows us something. It shows us the depth of God's word. I think it does. Remember, I'm doing about 20 or so minute sermons. The shortest one is about 16 minutes. The longest about 30. So within thereabouts 20-25 minute sermons each. Whereas other people probably could have spent hours talking about any one of the topics which I've spoken about so far. Um, now if things go as planned then there will be two more sermons after this one. Still based on the first chapter of Luke's Gospel. Um, before we move on to the second chapter. If each one of them is about 20 minutes each. Then we will have spent just under five hours in just the first chapter of this book. Now, I hope this gives you some amount of appreciation for the depth of God's word, where we can spend five hours in a book which is primarily about Jesus before we even get to him. Now, here's the thing. Despite the fact that we haven't even met Jesus yet, everything that has happened so far has pointed towards him. Obviously, there was the foretelling of his own birth, but there was also the foretelling of John's birth, John the Baptist, who would later go on to be the herald for Christ. And so therefore, even though it's about John the Baptist, it's ultimately about Jesus, because Jesus, uh, John's whole life pointed towards Jesus. So I, th I just think that's such a, a wonderful thing. So, so far, we've mainly been focused, uh, focusing in a roundabout sort of a way, on Christ. Today the focus shifts slightly as we will be studying uh, studying the Magnificat. The Magnificat is the song that Mary sang during her visit to Elizabeth. It's a song of praise. And, uh, it is a wonderful song as you were about to hear. Uh, its main focus is not on Mary of course even though she's the one singing it. Mary's not really the focus of this part of the text. Instead the main focus is where it should be. The main focus of the Magnificat is God. So let's read it. If we go to Luke chapter 1, verse, starting at verse 46, ending at verse 56. So about 10 verses. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, and behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in the remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And mercy, uh, Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. Now, before we get into talking about the magnific Magnificent itself, um, I want to I want to just quickly say by the way, remember for those of you who's, who've been watching through the series, the, the the one or two people who've been watching through the series, you'll remember near the start of the series, I based an entire one of these sermons on a brief mention of casting lots, and I managed to get about sixteen minutes out of it. So, I mean, you you've heard there from the from 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 the magnificent, each one of these verses could get an entire sermon. I could do an entire series on each one of these verses and repeat myself maybe once or twice throughout the entire thing. You know, it, it's just so jam-packed with so much goodness and it really does exemplify what I was saying before about how um, brilliantly, splendidly in-depth God's word is. So maybe someday I'll come back and I'll do a series on this going into more depth. But for uh, today, we're going to be uh, looking at the entire thing. 
uh, kind of as one. And uh, there is a reason for that. See, the framework I've decided to go for with this series is that as much as I can, I want to follow these subheadings in the Bible. Um, now, my Bible is an English Standard Version and ESV. For some reason, the ESV includes the part about Mary going home under the Magnificent subheading. Now, personally, I think it makes more sense to start the next section, which is the birth of John the Baptist, at this verse rather than after it, so that way the Magnificent setting or the Magnificent, uh, magnificent passage um, gets to is all that's in under the magnificent heading uh, however as i have said or sorry no yeah, however as i've said i i'm trying to follow the subheading um and this is just the way the subheadings are that's just the way they're done now it, it's true that like i could just leave this verse until next time not cover this verse now and just do it next time so that way i'm only doing the magnificent but see, for some reason, I'm wired to ignore simple fixes to the smaller problems. So in my mind, even though I know this isn't really a problem to begin with, I have just decided to make a problem out of it and ignore the obvious solution. Uh, and I think I've just with that little ramble figured out the real reason why it's taken us more than three and a half hours to get to this point. We're already six and a half minutes in, my goodness. Anyway, look. Enough joking around, let's just get into it. Like I said, I'm going to start by just getting the last verse out of the way. I'm going to do that, and then we're going to go into the actual uh, Magnificent. So, Mary stayed for three months before going home. Now, I find that sort of interesting. The Bible doesn't give us a reason for her choice, but I think it's at least somewhat noteworthy that Mary left just before John was born. If you remember, at the start of the visit, uh, the visit Elizabeth was just six months pregnant, and... The visit lasted three months so it's possible that elizabeth asked mary to leave or mary didn't want to be there uh, on account of the coming baby it's also possible that there was a different reason maybe mary just missed joseph or maybe there's no real reason at all uh, mary just decided to go home when she did because she just felt like it here look that can be your homework for today go and see if there's any plausible reason for why mary would have left or if it, if i'm just looking too much into this Anyway, now that we've wasted 7 minutes and 32 seconds, let's actually get started on the proper study. Um, now, in verse 46, Mary says her soul magnifies the Lord. The Lord. Now, that's not to say that um, she made God seem bigger in any way. That's not what the verse is saying. Rather, this verse is saying that Mary worshipped the Lord with a love for him that went right down to her core. That's the main point of this verse. Now, the next verse says her spirit rejoiced in the Lord. This verse says it was her soul. The next verse says it was her spirit. Now, this text isn't trying to say that the soul and the spirit are different. I've seen plenty of people try to say that, oh, there's, there's the body, there's the soul, and there's the spirit, and divide them. I don't know if there's any biblical basis for the soul and the spirit not being the same thing. I don't think that there is. I could be wrong, but I don't, from what I've seen, I don't think that there is. Um, Instead, what's really happening here is it's just using a different word to show how deep Mary's worship of God is. R.C. Sproul pointed out that this is a Hebrew um, poetry technique. Basically, you just use two different, two similes, two different words that mean the same thing to get your point across better. So that's, that's all this is, just using two different words to show how deep Mary's worship of God was. It was down to her very core, to her spirit, to her soul. She was worshipping the Lord in pure happiness and love with everything that she had. Now, we see similar instances um, to this one in other parts of Scripture. If we go to 2 Samuel 6.14, it says, And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. Now, in 2 Samuel, David is so overcome by a love for God and a want to worship him that he loses control of himself and just dances using every part of his body to give praise to the lord now mary obviously didn't go as far as david did in her worship but it's clear that she was uh, very passionate about it now we'll move on to verse 48 where mary notes how from that day forth every generation will call her blessed now i must say again and I, I've, I've said this in other videos Mary was blessed because she received a wonderful thing from God, not because of anything in and of herself. Uh, if we go back to verse 47 quickly, there Mary calls God her saviour. Now, anyone who knows the Bible 
that therefore anyone who denies Mariology, um, anyone who knows the Bible, knows why God is our saviour. He saves us from his own wrath. But why is he wrathful? Well, he is wrathful because we have sinned. We have sinned against him. Everyone is a sinner. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, the only way to be saved um, is to be in a situation of peril. If you're not in a situation of peril, you can't be saved because there's nothing to be saved from. Now, every person who has ever lived has placed themselves into this situation of peril by sinning. Therefore, everyone needs a saviour. Here's the thing. Catholics claim that Mary didn't sin. If Mary was sinless, how come she calls God her saviour? If she is sinless, then she hasn't placed herself into that state of peril. If God is Mary's saviour, then Mary needed to be saved. Therefore, Mary was a sinner. I believe even Thomas Aquinas, one of the early church fathers, uh, made that very clear. I tried looking for a direct quote, but everything I got was just Catholic sources saying, no, this isn't true, no, this isn't true. Um, but I was watching R.C. Sproul's, one of his sermons about, uh, this, pa- about this passage, and he mentioned that Thomas Aquinas did in fact um, deny the Immaculate Conception, the idea that Mary was sinless. And I think that the, um, while I wasn't able to sift through and find an actual quote from him, it, it is interesting um, the massive amount of effort that's gone into disproving this. So I don't know. It seems to me like he did deny the Immaculate Conception. Um, but who knows? Look, we, we learn from the Corinthians that false teaching crept into the church very early. So it's possible that the early church fathers were wrong about that, as I'm sure a lot of them were. Because, um, of course, the early fathers weren't or aren't the Bible. Um, but it is interesting to see how different the early church was from what the Catholic church currently is. Uh, and that includes um, when we talk about Mary. Now, it's interesting how I I don't usually intend to bring up the numerous flaws in the Roman Catholic view of Mary, but simply studying any part of the Bible that includes Mary in any way almost always leads to the realisation that a lot of Mariology is just pure nonsense. When you look at what the Bible says about Mary and you just think about it, she needs a savior, therefore she was in peril. Why was she in peril? Well, because she was a sinner. Now, it's true that that could refer to God saving her out of any other sort of a peril, not necessarily the peril of sin. It could be, you know, God at certain stages saves Israel out of um, calamity at the hands of other nations, I believe. And in those cases, he's called their savior. But Mary was in no danger in this passage. There was no calamity alluded to. There's nothing else at all. It's not like she was in Elizabeth's position where she'd lived her entire life infertile. She was yet to be married and therefore was a virgin. So it's not like um, God was bringing her out of the some amount of trouble like he was with Elizabeth. We don't get any of that in this verse. We know that she was in some sort of peril and that she caused God her saviour. The most likely reason is that she realises she's a sinner and therefore needs to be saved by God. It's interesting. You just think these things through and a lot of what the church has just made up throughout the years really starts to fall apart. Now, let's move on to verse 49. Here we see that God's name is holy. God is so holy that even his name is considered holy. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's just started raining very heavily. I don't know what's going on today. It started off raining, and then it was sunny, now it's raining again. Anyway, that's not important. Now, we see throughout the Bible the holiness of God's name. Not just of God. Of course, the holiness of God is mentioned many times. But the holiness of God's name is referenced in numerous parts of Scripture. 
For example, Jesus starts the Lord's Prayer by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed or blessed is your name. As well as that, we are told throughout Scripture not to take the Lord's name in vain. When the Jewish scribes were writing down or copying down Scripture, um, whenever they got to a part that included God's name, they would just take out a new writing. Whatever they were writing, which they put it down, they take out a new writing utensil, biro or whatever they had back then, um, which they then used, and it had never been used before, and then they used it to write down God's name that one time, and then they threw it away. When they were done writing God's name, which was just four letters, um, they threw it away, threw away the utensil, so that it could never be used to write anything again. They wouldn't even use it to write down God's name a second time. That's how holy God's name is. They would write it once with the one utensil, and... Never use that utensil for anything else, not even writing down God's name again. That's how holy it was, special it was, set apart it was. And where's that reverence today? We don't see that holiness respected today. Watch any modern secular show and you'll hear um, a character when angry using God's name in vain. People have become very creative with how they use it as well. Now, I'm not going to repeat the ways people use his name, obviously, but they tend to sort of put God that is the father and the son, into certain situations. Like, you've probably all heard the expression that involves one of the members of the Trinity riding upon a bicycle, um, or tap dancing, or up on top of a donkey, or something like that, pushing them into these situations. Our culture is so deprived that people are using their creativity to find new ways of taking God's name in vain. How far this world has fallen. Moving on, in verse 50, we see Mary talk about God's mercy to those who fear him. Now, this brings up two points, the fear we should have of God and the mercy he has for us. Now, we'll start with the fear of God. Uh, I'm currently reading through Billy Graham's book, Facing Death and the Life After. Now, look, Graham was an Arminian, so I do disagree with a lot of the things he said, or at least some of the things he said in this book, um, like the idea that death wasn't part of God's original plan for us and what have you. But... He does talk about fear at one stage, and I really do agree with what he says about fear, so give me a second while I'll find it. Um, yeah, you're probably not used to me having to find things, because whenever I quote scripture, I just put it into my notes, or I just copy-paste it into the like, little script I have here, so I'm not used to flicking through books to try and find quotes, but anyway, here we are now. So this is um, Billy Graham, Facing Death and the Life After. In my copy of the book, it's pages 58 and 59. The Bible refers to fear more than 500 times, generally telling us not to be afraid. There are so many fear nots that we could probably have one for every day in the year, and then some. Look at a few of them. Fear none of these things, Revelation 2, 10 KJV. Fear not, for I am with thee, Genesis 26, 24 KJV. Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, Exodus 14, 13 KJV. Fear not your enemies, Deuteronomy 30, um, 3 to 22 KJV. Fear not them which kill the body, Matthew 10 28 KJV. Fear not, believe only, Luke 8 50 KJV. We'll probably get onto that verse in a few years if we ever get past the first chapter. Uh, fear not, I am the first and the last, Revelation 1 17 KJV. But wait, what do we do with the fear of the Lord? If the Bible says fear not, and yet it also says fear, which does it mean? The answer is both. Fear is a twofold word. It refers to an emotion marked by dread and anxious concern, but it, all, it is also the word that means awe and profound reverence. This is the fear that inspires trust and confidence. When we fear God, we don't cringe before him like a prisoner robbed of his freedom by a ruthless dictator. Our fear is a love which causes us to treat him with respect. This is what the prophet Isaiah meant when he said the fear of the Lord is the key to this treasure in Isaiah 33, 6. It is a reverence that comes when we see the majesty and holiness of our loving Father, Heavenly Father. Uh, there is no shame in being afraid. We're all afraid from time to time. But there's an interesting paradox here in that if we fear God with all our hearts, there will be nothing else to fear. When I see a child placing his little hand confidently in the bigger hand of his father, I recognize the sort of fear that fosters trust. When it rains and then freezes over in 
Our mountains in North Carolina, the winding roads become treacherous. I can remember walking with my children, slipping and sliding through the woods. When they held my hand, the children were less afraid. It was up to me not to let them fall down. Our Heavenly Father asks us to place our trust in him and he will steady us. To fear God does not mean, and this is me speaking now, to fear God does not mean that we live in terror as if God is some villain who might leap from behind a curtain at any second and get us. It means to have respect for him, to have reverence. Next, we're going to look at God's mercy. God is extremely merciful. God is so merciful that he looked down upon us, sinful wretches as we are, and decided to show us mercy. He was so intent on showing his people mercy that he sent his only son to die on a cross so that both his mercy and his righteousness could be satisfied. Now, I put so much emphasis on the and because a lot of people like to claim that God sacrificed his own righteousness to show us mercy. That is not the case. God doesn't just abandon his own character. He is perfect as he is. If he ever stopped being exactly who he is, he would no longer be perfect. But God is perfect. And part of that perfection is is his mercy, as Mary highlights for us here. Now we'll go on to verse 51. We see that Mary talks about God's strength and about how he feels toward the proud. Now I'm going to start with his strength. God is infinitely strong. The Bible says he's as strong as an ox, or it uses a phrase that means, it's basically the old version of as strong as an ox. It's The word for ox is um, an old type of cow, that I think went extinct a few hundred years ago. And it was from around that part of the world. But funnily enough, the King James puts it as strong as a unicorn um, due to some iffy translation. Um, now that's something, something which I find interesting is that because there are so-called King James onlyists and the King James makes reference to unicorns due to, as I said, a faulty translation, that means that there are fully grown men and women walking around today who, because of their version of the Bible, and because they don't think any other version of the Bible is any good, genuinely believe unicorns existed, or possibly do exist. That's equal parts funny and sad in my warped mind. Anyway, before we move on from this topic, I want to address um, you know that old question, could God create a rock that was so heavy even he couldn't lift it? Now, the official uh, uh, answer around this one um, is not great because it says that um, the question requires God to be both infinitely strong and also not infinitely strong or something like that. Basically, it's um, oh, you know, it's not a good question because yes and no, or it's some sort of roundabout answer. It's not a great answer, in my opinion, uh, and I, I'm just not convinced by it, and I actually think I have an answer for that question that's better. So. Could God create a rock so heavy even he couldn't lift it? My answer is no. You see, when God lifts something, it's not like when we lift something. I'm I'm looking forward now, there's a chair in front of me. If I wanted to lift that one foot in the ground, one foot from the ground, I would have to go over, grab it, and exert physical strength to hoist it up um, one foot into the ground, and I'd have to exert a certain amount of physical energy when god wants to lift something he doesn't exert physical energy god doesn't have to grab something and lift it because god isn't a physical being he's spirit i'm looking at this chair now and like i say if i wanted to lift it i'd have to go over and exert physical energy if god wants to lift it he just has to will it to lift and it will he doesn't exert physical energy it's a matter of his will and the will is not affected by physical exertion therefore the weight of an object doesn't matter because the weight is only a problem because of physical exertion so because god doesn't use energy he doesn't exert energy when doing things the weight doesn't matter so the rock can be as heavy as it wants it doesn't affect it it doesn't affect anything asking you know could God create a rock so heavy he couldn't lift it? Really makes about as much sense as asking, could God create a rock that was such a dark shade of the colour blue he couldn't lift it? In the same way, a rock's colour doesn't change 
or doesn't matter, or anything's color doesn't matter for when we lift things, because when we lift things, what we're mainly dealing with is its weight. The weight doesn't matter for God, because when God wants something to lift, he doesn't deal with the weight. He just deals with his own will for it to lift, or for, for anything to happen. So, no, God couldn't create a rock so heavy that he couldn't lift, in the same way that he couldn't create a rock that was so darkly blue that he couldn't lift it. Not because he is limited, but because it just has no bearing on the situation at all. And so I, I, I don't like the philosophical answer for that one, the iffy roundabout answer, because it really is unsatisfying. I think once you have a good understanding of God and who he is and how he does things, the answer becomes quite clear. And I think that the answer I have for that is the correct answer. And I think it's quite clear. Now, next I wanna talk about how God feels about the proud. The verse says that he scatters the proud in their, uh, in their own mind. Now, the next verse talks about it more, saying that he brings the mighty down from their throne and he lifts up the humble. Now, we know from a multitude of Bible verses that God isn't fond of the proud, but he is quite fond of the humble. We see that when, he, uh, when we look at the parable, for example, of the tax collector and the Pharisee, which... Uh, we will be covering at a later stage in the series because it's one of those parables that is recorded in, in Luke and nowhere else. Uh, I won't go into it now, but, you know, go read it for yourself. God values humility and he frowns upon arrogance. In verse 53, we see that he uh, fills the hungry with good things. Now, we know God provides for all people, uh, people and that's not just for believers. I do mean all people. If we go to the gospel according to saint matthew chapter 5 verse 45 it says so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends the rain on the just and on the unjust god is good and merciful and kind to all people whether or not they are numbered among the elect the verse also tells us that he sends the rich away empty. This shows that for those who rely purely on themselves, they will not get very far. We must all rely on God. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? In the final two verses, we see that God has helped Israel, just like he promised Abraham that he would. This shows us that God is faithful. He keeps his promises. When he says that he's going to do something, he does it. So, what application can we get from this passage? Well, I believe that the more we know about God, the better our worship will ultimately be. We see the character of God laid out quite plainly here. He is kind loving, merciful, faithful to keep his promises. He looks favorably upon the humble and is unimpressed by arrogance. Mary knows all this. That's why she sings it with so much passion that she says she is worshiping God from within her very core, uh, her spirit, her soul. Have you ever worshiped God like that? Probably not to the same degree as Mary, no. This shows us how good God is when he blesses someone, when he blesses his people in such a way as this, they can't help but worship him. It takes over their bodies, the need to worship him, the want to worship him, takes them over and drives them like it did with David in Second Samuel. This feeling of needing to worship him took over him and he lost control of his body and he just danced in worship for the Lord. God deserves our worship. He doesn't just want it. He deserves it. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that here because I've already done a sermon uh, in this series on the importance of proper worship. You can go back and find that. It was just a few episodes ago if you, if you want to, if you're interested. Um, but I just want to remind everyone, like I said, and you need to remember this, it's important to remember this. God doesn't want our worship. He doesn't. Doesn't just want it, excuse me. He doesn't just want our worship. He deserves our worship. 
we owe it to him. Now, I don't know who's listening to this, so I don't know whether or not you're saved. What I do know is that God loves his people and is kind and merciful to them and he keeps his promises. Not just to his people. If he makes a promise to anybody, he's keeping it. Now, one of the promises God makes to his people is the forgiveness of their sins. As I briefly mentioned before, everyone is a sinner. That includes you, Romans 3, 9 and 10. It lays out quite clearly as well as other places in Romans and 2 Kings, so on and so forth. So many places in the Bible make it so clear. We are all sinners. But if you'll only repent and believe the gospel, God can and will forgive you of your sins. You are in a state of peril. God is the only one who can save you. In this pa passage, Mary recognised that, even though others don't want to recognise it about her. Now, I want you to recognise it about yourself. If you haven't already, I want you to recognise the position you are in, the dangerous, horrible position you are in. Repent and believe the gospel. It is the only way to be saved. Christ and Christ alone is the way we were saved. People say that there's many roads through life, and it's true that there is. Every, you know, there's millions of roads, Buddhism, Islam, all this stuff, and they're all going to a place called, or they're all going to a place, uh, and, you know, if you want to imagine, like, there's this gate with a sign out front, and they're all going to a place where the sign out front reads, heaven but only one of those places is actually heaven everywhere promises enlightenment everywhere promises deliverance only one road actually delivers god delivers on his uh, delivers on his promises as we've read here he saves his people People say there's, there's many answers to the questions of life, and that's true. There are many answers to the questions of life, but only one of those possible answers is actually true. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. Following him is the only way to see salvation. Now, I hope you liked this video, and I hope you found it enjoyable. But most of all, I hope you found it edifying. Thank you for joining me on this study of the wonderful word of our wonderful God. I hope you join me again next time. Thanks for watching. Goodbye and God bless.